All right, so in the previous part, we have seen how finding corresponding points, and that's the hard problem of stereo, can be simplified by looking for the apropolar line of a point in the other view, a line on which the corresponding point in that other view has to lie. Now, the initial calculation of the apropolar line was all based on knowing everything about the cameras, the positions, the rotations, the internal settings. But then at the very end, we saw Actually, you can take the reverse path as well. So if you have a number of correspondences, from those correspondences in principle, you could then calculate the focal, uh, the fundamental matrix F. And F pretty much summarizes the uh, apipolar geometry. So some remarks about that. Um, so indeed, as we ended uh, the um, last part, we would like to use more corresponding point pairs if we have more available. So what we can do is to go for a least square solution and then impose rank 2 after that least uh, square solution has been found. Also, in another part of the course, we have seen interest points. So points that really stick out, that we can identify rather uniquely in an image. And these interest points are often good candidates to be found in both images at the same time, thus forming candidate corresponding point pairs. So, interest points are a key element often in finding corresponding point pairs and from that finding the fundamental matrix F. Okay, here's some examples. So, this is a stereo pair. On the left hand side, we have a number of points that we have highlighted. And on the right hand side, we have the corresponding points, but also, quite faintly, but also the apipolar lines. So, these apipolar lines have been calculated knowing the setup of the cameras, in this case, the forward calculation. So, for the three points, we calculate the corresponding three apipolar lines. And as you can see here, indeed, the corresponding points do lie on these apipolar lines, as we expected and demand. Okay, so that calculation pretty, went uh, pretty well, it seems. So here are the three apipolar lines again. Yeah. Okay. Thus far we have been telling the story about you have a point in one view, you look for the corresponding apipolar line in the other view, and there you look for the corresponding point in that other view. So it's very much a point to line story. And of course, in order to get the apipolar line, you have to first have the fundamental matrix. And you can get at that in two ways, in a forward manner for a calibrated stereo setup or from all outstanding points, somehow points that are uh, very special and that you can easily find as uh, corresponding point pairs. And then if you have enough of those, eight, maybe seven, you can also find F. But that is the use of F. From there on, any further correspondence can be found much more easily because a point in one plane let you search along only a line, the apipolar line, in the other plane. Okay, so, but point to line. But actually, we can go for more symmetry in this whole equation. So if you have this set up here, we have two cameras with the center of projection C1 and C2, and then you have also the uh, image planes for the two cameras. Um, so now if you have a point for one view, you can look for the apipolar line in the other. So suppose you have the physical point in space is here, and that would be its image projection in the first camera. Now we have to look for the apipolar line in the second view. 
and here it is, that is the Evapola line, along that line must be somewhere the corresponding point for that point, but now in the second view. If you look at this drawing, what you see, of course, is that actually this epipolar line here, the projection of this line, the projection ray, onto the second image plane, is nothing but the intersection of a plane in space with this second image plane, namely the plane spanned by C1, C2 and P. This forms a triangle that defines a plane. If you intersect that plane with this image plane, that's where this apipolar line can be found. But now we can also take the reverse position. We could say, OK, suppose we start from the second view. That's the point where that uh, point of space projects to in the second view. Where is the apipolar line in the first view? Well, same story. It's the intersection of that very same plane that we had before, but now with a first image plane. That gives this line, the apipolar line, in the first view for that original point here in the second view. And we have basically been using all the same geometric entities for both stories. And that you also see in the equation P prime transpose F fundamental matrix. P is zero. We can either fix P, the point in the first view, and then have P prime transpose F yielding the line coordinates of the epipolar line in the second view. Or you could, with the same equation, fix P prime and then you get FP for the line coordinates of the epipolar line in the first view. You can use it either way. It's symmetric. And that you also see here in this drawing. Actually, it goes a little bit further than that because take any point along this line. All those points also lie in this plane. And that means all the lines connecting a point here along that line and that central projection, all these projection rays through points on this line also yield the same apipolar line in the second view. Okay? It's all about the intersection of the same planes, this plane and that plane. So wherever, wherever you look along this apipolar line, all these points Whatever point you use along that apipolar line has the same apipolar line on this side. And vice versa. Any point you would select along that line, so if you select some point here, all these points have the same apipolar line on that side as well. Now that means that in practice we will not just take a point then look at the corresponding point on the apipolar line of that point in the other view and do that point per point per point in the first view every time calculating a new apipolar line in the second. No, what people typically do is to work based on pairs of corresponding apipolar lines because basically that is what we have here. So this apipolar line corresponds to that apipolar line. Any point along that apipolar line must have a corresponding point along that apipolar line. And so you have a whole pencil of apipolar lines on both sides, and they come as corresponding pairs. Like these new lines we have now drawn, they also correspond. And any point on that new apipolar line here will have a corresponding point on the new apipolar line here as well and so on. So it's all about planes that are actually hinging around the line connecting C1 and C2. So you have the line connecting C1 and C2 and all the planes hinging around that line. 
and they yield all these pairs of corresponding equipolar lines on both sides. And you work your way along one equipolar line on one side and look for the correspondences along the corresponding equipolar line on the other side. Then you go to the next equipolar line on the first side and look for all the corresponding points along the corresponding equipolar line on the second side, and so on and so forth. Okay? So that is a much more um, efficient way of looking for correspondences. So here another stereo pair, and this time we don't have a point on one side, and then the corresponding apipolar line on the other. We immediately have here pairs of corresponding apipolar lines, according to the story we just went through. And you can probably rather easily make out which pairs are corresponding. For instance, if you take this line here, this is the corresponding line on the other side. And you can inspect how indeed all the points along the line on the left have the corresponding hippopotamus line at the right hand side. Okay. So here again, this story, right? So we have these apipolar lines found as in the sections of the different planes hinging around the line connecting the centers of projection. Right. Okay. Now we are still not there yet. We have a Basically, for every point in the first image, also in a polar line in the second, on which somewhere must lie the corresponding point. Thing is, we still don't quite know which point it is. So, there are a number of uh, further constraints we can use. So, first of all, the point has to lie in the apipolar line. Yes, that we know. But sometimes we have more information. We know about minimal distance and maximum distance for which we will find all the points. And that will translate itself in, in fact, only having to look along an interval along the apipolar line and not the entire apipolar line to find the corresponding points. An assumption that's often made is the preservation of order. And that means that if you go along a pair of corresponding apipolar lines, if one point is on the left of another point in the first view, that then the corresponding points are found in the same order. So the corresponding point of this point on the other side will still be to the left of this point, the corresponding point of this point on the other side. So you have the same order. That is not always safe, though. You can imagine that there are situations where that does not happen. You can actually think about when that condition breaks down. Often, for most points in the scene, it is true, though. But not always, as it. Here's a counterexample. Suppose you have your two fingers. You hold them between your eyes. So if you look with your left eye, close on the right one, you see, the back point is to the left of the, the point closest to my uh, nose. And if I do the reverse, I look through my right eye, the opposite happens. It's an example where order is disturbed, where you don't have the same order, where left from becomes right from on the other side. So, to be enjoyed with some care, one can say for the preservation of order. Often it works, but not always. Think about not when not to trust it. And then uh, smoothness of the disparity field. We have seen something similar for optical flow, where you expect that nearby points have the same optical flow vector. Here we can do a bit the same. We can expect that nearby points have similar disparities. So, again, kind of regularization thing often is an optical flow like analysis that you can apply to stereo, and then you can also use a smoothness uh, condition. That will hold for most, but not for all the points. Right. 
But even all those things are just qualitative in nature. They still don't pinpoint the exact corresponding point on the apopolar line. We still have to find a solution for that. And here are some tricks that people have been using. First of all, uh, when finding correspondences, you can look at correlations. So you can look at the intensity pattern around the point in the first view. Look at the intensity pattern around your point in the first view, and then take that as a mask. You copy that pattern, and you shift it on the other view along the apopolar line until you find a maximum correlation or normalized correlation. So you look for a similar intensity pattern in the other view, and then you say, aha, that's where I have to be. Now, there are some limitations, like if the camera position is very different for the two cameras, there will be lots of deformations of that intensity pattern in the other view, and things will start to do, become more difficult. If you also look at uh, such a window, the question is, what size should it have? If it's too small, there are too many patterns that are very similar, so it's not very telling, not very discriminative. On the other hand, if you take a very large window, you will start to have bad localization because there is some deformation going on in the other view, so we go through kind of a maximum of correlation, but it will not be very outspoken. So you have to find a good size, basic correlation. The good thing is that, in principle, you can do that for all the points in the first view, find the corresponding point in the second. There are all kinds of techniques to take smoothness and so on in account as well. The second technique is looking at features. So rather than looking at all the points, maybe you can content yourself with only finding correspondences for special points, like corner points. Maybe some of the corners you have already been using to calculate F, but then there will be still a lot of points where you're not so certain, you have a lot of doubt where the correspondence may be. Well, but here, now, after having calculated F, you have the hyperbola line. So if you take a corner on one side, you can look along its hyperbola line on the other and only look at the corners that lie on that line. And probably there are very few. So if you take a corner and you look for the corresponding corner on the other side, along the hyperbola line, probably there are only very few. So again, that will simplify the corresponding search a lot but now only for corners. And that's a bad thing. This is not very dense. You then only have correspondences for the handful of corners that you have in an image, maybe a few thousand. So that yields a sparse depth map. And then, as I said, in many cases, people try to deal with uh, stereo in kind of an optical flow manner, also with regularization constraints and so on. But we don't have time to really go into that. We have seen that kind of analysis for optical flow already, so you have uh, an idea how that works. In the end, if you have now two points that are supposed to be corresponding, P and P prime, the question is now, what are the 3D coordinates? And for that, you have to take the intersection of these two projection rates, that's a triangulation, that we are now finally able to do. So you have, let's say, P and you have P prime. If you have the full setup, and that's now again assuming calibration, then you can intersect these two rates. Where they intersect, that's where the point is in 3D. Now notice it's absolutely not guaranteed that you will have a good intersection. In principle you should, if you have infinite precision. These are six equations in five and ohms, so it's overdetermined actually. The five and ohms are x, y and z, but also mu and mu prime. So in trying to intersect these two uh, lines, because you have three equations on top and then three equations below, but you have only five unknowns. For an important remark, you will make mistakes. You will make mistakes in the calibration. Your R, R prime, K, K prime, C, C prime, 
and also the coordinates of the image projections of the corresponding point pair will not be perfect, so there will be noise all over the place, and that means these two lines will probably not intersect. They will go like that, right? So they will not intersect. That is what is probably going to happen in practice. Now, the solution, and there's also a closed form solution for that, is to, in that case, go for uh, where these lines come closest to each other and then take the middle point of that pair of points on the two lines where they come closest. So that's an algebraic solution for this problem. So, here you can also see the assumption is that you know C, R, K, C prime, R prime, K prime. So the whole system has to be calibrated in order to go for that triangulation calculation. But we then also saw a way of avoiding calibration when it came to calculating F. But now, if at the very end we still need calibration, maybe that reverse calculation of F from point correspondences doesn't bring us that much after all. Well, actually it does. Because one can prove that even if you don't have a calibrated camera system, you only know about correspondences found with the help of the hyperbolic geometry, you can still make a reconstruction. But a reconstruction that is maybe not metrically precise. And here is what we mean. So, for instance, if you have two cameras, we have basically one camera, and you just translate it. You don't know exactly by how much, in what direction. Also, the internal settings of the camera are not really known, yet you can make a reconstruction. It is not form perfect. The scale is not determined. And there may be a, a skew, but it will be a fine. So on the left-hand side, you have two images from such a translated set. So we had a camera, we translated it and took a new view. That is the pair of views coming out, and this is the reconstruction you can build. And what you see here is that between the back plane and the bottom, we have actually not 90 degrees. It may be not so easy to see, but this is not, not really 90 degrees. You see this, this kind of angle. And that's because the reconstruction is only precise up to an unknown 3D affine transformation. So this is a 3D reconstruction up to an unknown 3D affinity. And affine transformations can, can skew things, so they can uh, make things that are supposed to be orthogonal, no longer orthogonal. Aff affinities will destroy angles in general. Also relative scale, uh, scales along different axes. So, reconstruction, but yeah, a little bit sloppy. But you can make that without any calibration. Okay. Um, okay, but that's if you have a, a camera that purely translates. That's a special condition, right? That uh, is probably not going to happen too often if you have a camera in your hands, for instance, you move a, camera, a handheld camera around, uh, probably you won't be able to translate. You will have a general motion in between. So, is that in a hopeless case? Well, no. It's still... Well, it's impossible to do something. So, if you just have two views with an arbitrary motion in between, you can still build a projective reconstruction, as we would call it. And that means this is a reconstruction that is correct up to an unknown 3D projective transformation. Now, projective transformations can do all kinds of warps that are much stranger than what affinities can do, by the way. So it may start to look a bit awkward after a projective reconstruction. But that's not the most interesting bit. The interesting thing is that if you have three views, and there can be general motions in between, then you can do a metric reconstruction. Meaning, now we have a reconstruction that is correct up to unknown 3D similarity. So everything is correct. All the angles, relative sizes, relative distances throughout, 
The only thing that is unknown is the overall scale of the thing. So you make uh, the construction as maybe too big or too small. But A, hey, that's to be fixed very easily. It's sufficient to know just one distance and you can fix the scale. I'm not sure whether we have the three views here, no. But here we have the construction. And if you would start to look carefully at the construction, angles of 90 degrees are 90 degrees, circles are circles, and so on and so forth. So here we have a metric error. It is a reconstruction correct up to an unknown similarity transformation in 3D. So the great news actually is that without having calibrated anything, you can still make decent 3D constructions as soon as you have three views or more. Now there are all kinds of additional technicalities, conditions you may impose on your camera or not. And it depends a little bit on which of these uh, assumptions you make what you can do. But the overall story is you can hop around with the camera in your hand, not knowing of course what motion you are making precisely, and get a decent 3D reconstruction of a scene just from that input, never having calibrated a thing by hand. There's an internal calibration going on actually, but uh, we can't go there. Here's the pipeline that we have in that case. In comes some images. You find some correspondences, uh, some special points that already allows you to calibrate the whole thing and also to generate hyperpolar geometry between the views. Then you fill in the details because now you can find extra correspondences and in the end you reconstruct. And there are two parts of the output. On the one hand the 3D construction, on the other hand you know where the camera has been relative to the scene. So here are some examples. Right? So these are different images taken of this building while walking around with the camera in one's hand. And this is the 3D construction. So in the back, the 3D construction of the scene, and then these uh, pyramids in front, they represent the cameras with the apex, the center of projection, and the base, the image plane. So you see where the different positions are from which images have been taken. Every pyramid stands for one image. And as you can also, this is not so regular. There are hops in between uh, where things were standing in the way and the person could not take an image and so on. So it is far from calibrated. The calibration happens in the software. Other example. So. One of the applications that we have been, used, uh, been using this for is uh, archaeology, because often archaeological sites are at difficult to reach places. So you can ha maybe have your very expensive and precise um, 3D uh, measuring equipment, LIDAR, we will come to that uh, later, but then you have to bring it to the place, and that may be literally also an uphill battle, very difficult to do. But what archaeologists will typically have is a camera. And now, to build a 3D reconstruction, a 3D record of what they have found, they only have to take pictures. And picture taking is what they do anyway. So it comes kind of for free for them. This is an example somewhere in the jungle of Mexico. This is uh, the Temple of the Masks at Etna. And here are a number of images, a few more were taken, but not many. And this is a 3D construction built from those different views. Okay, so this is a 3D construction. If you put the texture on, it becomes, of course, much more lively and real. Um, so that is a 3D construction without calibration from nothing but a set of images. And of course, where non-images could be taken, that's on top then also there is no reconstruction. Same for the one caves on the silk road in China, there we did also some work. So um, monks were actually carving out in their free time all these caves. 
um, and caravans would stop at such places to be uh, foreseen with water and all this stuff. This is a reconstruction again from some images of the inside of one of those caves. And again, it's then, based on pure imagery, rather easy to build a 3D record of the different caves. Preservation is always a big thing, certainly in uh, hazardous circumstances like uh, where these caves have been found. Okay. Final example, again, just taking some images of a statue. And then you can build from that a 3D reconstruction. So that's the result without texture. And then, of course, you can back project the texture of the different images onto the 3D. Um, the 3D is coming out of the images, so that back projection is very precise and easy. And that's now a textured version of one of the statues on that particular building. So since then, some applications have been built, including our own, which was actually the first of its kind. It's a website to which you can upload images, and then you get back the 3D that is being reconstructed based on those images. And this whole thing goes automatic. So you upload your images, when the system is ready, calculating the 3D, it notifies you, and you can download your 3D models.